If we haven't met, uh, my name is Daniel Sanchez. I'm one of the ministry training program students here at uh, Southside Bible Church. Uh, this morning we'll be looking at Mark's Gospel, uh, chapter 8, verses 14 through 21. Uh, and so I invite you to turn there, uh, and I'll, I'll pray for our time this morning. O oh Lord God, hallowed be your name in this place, uh, among this people, as we open up your word this morning. I pray that you would glorify and honor yourself in us. Lord God, my words are useless if they are not consistent with your word. My words are a clanging gong if they are without love. And so, Father, I pray that your spirit would be with us, that your spirit would guide us and teach us and direct this time this morning. I pray, Father, that as we look at this passage, as we look at this gospel, that you would teach us, that you would guide us, that you would change us, make us more like Christ, and help us to believe. Thank you, Heavenly Father. I pray and ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, starting now in Mark chapter 8, verses 14. This is God's word. Now they had forgotten to bring bread, and they only had one loaf with them in the boat. And he cautioned them, saying, Watch out, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. And they began discussing with one another the fact that they had no bread. And Jesus, aware of this, said to them, why are you discussing the fact that you have no bread? Do you not yet perceive or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Having eyes do you not see? And having ears do you not hear? And do you not remember? When I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you take up? They said to him, 12. And the seven for the 4,000, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you take up? And they said to him, seven. And he said to them, do you not yet understand? Let's pray once more. Oh Lord God, would you help us this morning? Would you give us understanding? Lord God, we believe, help our unbelief. I pray that as we open up your word this morning, that we would look, that we would look at your ministry, we would look at your gospel, look at what you've done, and you would give us understanding that we might see. Oh Lord God, I pray that you would save those who don't know you and that you would strengthen those who do. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for your word. Thank you for your goodness and your grace. Please grant us understanding and please make us more like Christ. In Jesus' name. Our Lord Jesus Christ did a great many things while he was on this earth. Uh, so many things did he do that the Apostle John, uh, at the end of his gospel, wrote that were every one of them to be written, I suppose the world itself could not contain the books that could be written. Now, aside from the fact that we should simply just be awestruck by how many miracles, how many things Jesus did while he was on earth, this shows us a few things, a few things that we should keep in mind as we're looking at this passage. First, what we have in this Bible, in, in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, is, is a sliver of what Jesus did. And so from this, from, from what John wrote, how many things Jesus did, what we get here, what we see in the gospel accounts, this is the most important stuff for us to know. And I think another implication that we should keep in mind as we look at this passage is that everything in these gospels, everything in Mark's gospel, every miracle, every teaching, every sign, all of it, it's here for a reason. Mark didn't just write this down and say, oh yeah, that was a cool miracle, we'll, we'll add that. No, everything here is here for a reason. So let's keep that in mind as we're looking at this passage uh, this morning. 
Uh, the, the passage we just read in Mark 8, it's roughly at the, the center of Mark's gospel. And, and really what this is doing is this is leading us to a very beautiful, very key, very critical point in Mark's gospel. But in order to understand that, we have to have a little bit of an understanding of, of what came before. So if you'll look with me, let's just take a brief overview of uh, what Mark says about Jesus' ministry in, in chapters 1 through, through 8. Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist, uh, and after he was baptized, he went out into the wilderness and was tempted by Satan. He triumphed, he withstood the temptation, and then he went out and began his ministry. He called the 12 disciples, he cast out demons, he healed people of various, his illness, or various illnesses, including leprosy, which caused people to be ritually unclean. Jesus preached the gospel, Jesus preached against the Pharisees and the Sadducees. As we read this morning, or Sean read this morning, Jesus multiplied bread and fed 5,000 people, beginning with five loaves and two fish. He showed his power over the sea by walking on water. He raised the dead. And that's, even that is not all-encompassing of what Jesus has done up until this point in Mark's gospel. But the point that we're saying here is that Jesus has preached the gospel, and Jesus has done many, many things up until this point. Right before this passage that we read, Jesus feeds the 4,000. He discusses something with the Pharisees. We'll get to that later. And then him and his disciples get on a boat and they begin going to the other side of a body of water. I don't unfortunately remember which one, but what Mark points out here in verse 14, this is interesting, they forgot to bring any more bread than one simple loaf. Now, most likely this was not a massive loaf of bread. This is a tiny little roll, certainly not fit to feed 13 men on what research has told me was roughly, would have been a six hour boat ride. So this is the context that we're setting here. You have 13 men in a boat with just one tiny loaf of bread to feed all of them. And Jesus, seeing this, warns his disciples, watch out. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. Now, Real quick caveat, I imagine we all know this, but leaven, leaven is a key ingredient in making bread. And it effectively is the difference between a delicious loaf of sourdough and a cracker. He says, beware the leaven of the Pharisees. And, and how do the disciples respond? It's almost as if Jesus says, watch out, beware of their leaven. And the disciples kind of say like, well, you know, speaking of leaven, Jesus, we don't have any bread. I'm kind of hungry. Thomas looks a little bit peckish over there. We, we don't have any food to eat. And Jesus responds to them saying, why are you discussing that you don't have any bread? Why, why are you discussing this? And it's interesting, you know, Jesus brought up leaven, key ingredient in bread, right? So why is it that when they start discussing amongst themselves that they have no bread, Jesus not only responds to them by chastising them for discussing their lack of bread, but he responds very strongly to them. Why does he do this? Well, the answer to this question is in what it is that Jesus is actually warning them against. What, what is the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod? Now, We'll discuss a tiny bit what, what leaven was like um, back in Jesus' time. Uh, leaven was typically a pinch of dough from the previous day's bread. And you would add it to uh, the current day's loaf of bread, and it would cause the bread to rise. Uh, the way that it works, you know, we could explain the science, but we'll leave it to the Apostle Paul, who wrote, a little leaven leavens the lump. You just need a tiny bit of leaven, and it leavens the entire lump. It grows, it spreads, it consumes the whole thing. So Jesus is not telling the Pharisees, hey, just watch out. The Pharisees have this little bit of raw dough. They carry it around in their pockets. Maybe Herod keeps it in his crown. Be, be afraid of that. No, he's telling them, watch out for this thing, that the, this thing of Herod and the Pharisees. It comes in, it's small, and it spreads. What is this? Well, Matthew's gospel actually gives us an explicit answer. Matthew says, uh, actually talking about the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, uh, Mark says Pharisees and Herod. Uh, Matthew 
specifically says that this is the teaching of the Pharisees and the teaching of the Sadducees. Now, the Pharisees taught self-righteousness and legalism. And so, I mean, of course, if scripture says it, it's true, right? Mark's getting at a different aspect of this. And so in one sense, absolutely. Leaven of the Pharisees, that is their teaching, that is their self-righteousness and their legalism. But, but Herod, in Mark's gospel at least, is not actively coming out and teaching something contrary to the gospel. And so what Mark is getting at here is something different than the teaching of the Pharisees and Herod. So Mark is showing us something else to be warned of. To understand what exactly this is, right? Because we see leaven, it's something of the Pharisees that comes in small and it grows and it consumes. What is it? Let's look at the Pharisees throughout Mark's gospel up until this point. See, the Pharisees are interesting. They don't like Jesus. They don't like him at all. And yet, they've been with him for much of his ministry. Sometimes when Jesus would perform miracles, he would do it specifically in front of them so that they could see it. Other times we see in the Gospels, it's almost like the Pharisees are spying on Jesus, creeping up on him. And when as soon as the disciples do something wrong, they kind of hop out and go, aha, we got you. They've seen all of Jesus's ministry. They've heard Jesus's teaching. They've heard his gospel. They've heard Jesus preaching against them, even at times. They're well aware of all of Jesus's ministry, even if they weren't there. And so what comes right before this passage? That, that gives us the answer. It's the, the, the context before. Jesus feeds the 4,000. There's 4,000 people. Jesus multiplies enough bread to feed them with leftovers. <laughs> That's pretty miraculous, right? But what happens right afterwards? Let's look in verse 11. What happens? The Pharisees came and began to argue with him seeking from him a sign from heaven to test him. And he sighed deeply in his spirit and said, why does this generation seek a sign? Truly, I say to you, no sign will be given to this generation. And he left them, got into the boat again, and went to the other side. Is, is this not absurd, what the Pharisees are doing here? I mean, on one hand, this might seem like an innocent request, but when we remember, the Pharisees have not only heard of a multitude of miracles that Jesus has done, more than Mark has recorded in his gospel, for sure, but they've not only been aware of it, but they've seen it. And now they come to him, and they say, show us a sign. They're not trying to, to believe in Jesus. They're trying to argue with him. I'm not a Greek scholar, but I have read Greek scholars who said that this word argue in verse 11 is a very soft word. They weren't coming to argue, they were coming to harass Jesus. So what's the leaven of the Pharisees? What is Jesus getting at here? The Pharisees saw all that Jesus had done. They had seen, they had experienced, they might have even tasted the bread that Jesus multiplied, who knows? They'd seen all of this, and yet they tried to test him. The Pharisees had unbelief. The Pharisees had unbelief. Well, what about Herod? Jesus warns about the leaven of Herod. Well, Herod's story is a little bit different. He didn't have these direct and indirect uh, interactions with Jesus, but he did have John the Baptist, the last great prophet of the old covenant. John the Baptist preached to Herod, convicting him, condemning him of heinous sin that he committed. And what did Herod do? He didn't repent. He didn't stop doing his sin and eagerly await the coming Messiah. No, he threw John the Baptist in jail. And when he got the opportunity, he cut off his head and killed him. Herod's problem, like the Pharisees, was unbelief. He did not believe the words of John the Baptist. And so Jesus is warning the disciples here of unbelief. But that, that still doesn't entirely answer why it is that Jesus responds the way that he does, right? The disciples start discussing amongst themselves the fact that they have no bread. Why doesn't Jesus just say, like he has explained other parables, why doesn't Jesus just respond and say, hey, you know, that was figurative. Maybe you guys don't get that. What I actually was referring to was unbelief. So just be aware of that, right? No, he says, he says, why are you discussing the fact that you have no bread? Do you not yet perceive or understand? Are your hearts hardened? 
Having eyes do you not see, and having ears do you not hear? Jesus is getting at a deeper problem here with the disciples. Notice here what he's saying. Are your hearts hardened? There's there's something that's causing their hearts to become hardened. And look at what else he says in verse 18. Having ears do you not see, or sorry, having eyes do you not see, and having ears do you not hear. This isn't a random question that Jesus is asking his disciples. This is a quotation from the prophet Jeremiah and the prophet Ezekiel. This isn't a favorable comparison. And the disciples growing up very likely would have understood here that Jesus is quoting prophets who were condemning God or who were rejecting God as a result of their sin, as a result of their unbelief. This is not a good comparison here. Jesus is saying, do you not yet understand? So what is it that they don't understand? When I read this passage a few weeks ago in my my personal time with God, I read through this, I got to verse 21, do you not yet understand? And I, I sat and I thought to myself, I don't think I understand. What is Jesus getting at here? I didn't know. But what I found was an incredibly beautiful truth that Jesus is getting at here. This is pointing to something wonderful. This is tying together beautiful things in Scripture. And what Jesus wants his disciples to see, what Jesus wants us to see is something beautiful. So let's look at what it is that Jesus wants us to understand. What is it that the disciples are missing? Let's look at the history of the disciples throughout Mark's gospel. When Jesus came out of the wilderness, he called the 12 disciples, and they were there with him throughout his entire ministry. So what does that mean? It means the disciples were there for all of Jesus' miracles. They were there for all of his teaching. They were there for his condemnation of the Pharisees. But beyond what the Pharisees themselves had, right? The Pharisees had Jesus' teaching and they saw his miracles. Jesus was a friend of his disciples. They could talk with him. They walked with him. They could ask him questions. They saw all of these things, but they're missing something. They're missing something. And as I studied through this passage, I realized I was missing something too. I had the same problem as the disciples. You see, I had just read through Mark 1 through 8. I'd read through the miracles. I'd read through Jesus' teaching. And yet I got to chapter 8, verse 21, and I still didn't understand. I think the reason is that I just read over the miracles. I said, oh, Jesus healed a, a deaf guy. That, that's cool. That's really you know, good for the deaf guy. Jesus cast out a demon. Okay. Just glossed over these miracles, but I didn't think about what they represented. I didn't think about why Mark might have put them here. Remember, so many miracles, so many things Jesus did that there's not enough books to contain it, right? So the things Mark put in here, they're important. And I don't want us to miss this because it is beautiful why Jesus did the things that he did, what Mark is trying to get at here. And so I want us to look through some of these miracles and and see what it is that Jesus wants us to understand, what it is that the disciples were missing and Jesus wanted them to understand. In order to do that, we have to look at Genesis first, just for a little bit. Back in Genesis 3, we see perhaps the most, one of the most (laughs) tragic events in Scripture, the fall of man. Adam and Eve were put in paradise in the Garden of Eden. Without sin, God called them very good. They were made to worship God, to walk with God, to glorify Him. One day, however, Satan, the devil, the serpent, comes and he tempts Eve. She eats of the fruit that God had commanded uh, Adam and Eve to not eat of, and humanity is plunged into sin. This brought with it many, many bad things. As a result of this, as a result of this one sin, we have sickness, 
We have uncleanliness. We have pain. We have hunger. We have death. Those are just the physical aspects. There's spiritual effects as well. There's spiritual consequences to the fall. As a result of sin, sin that we now carry with us, we can't stand before a holy God because we have sin. We are unclean before God and we cannot come into his presence to worship him. We now are spiritually blind and deaf to the creation which loudly boasts, loudly proclaims the glory of God. We don't seek after God. Our biggest problem is that we are spiritually dead. But God gives hope. God gives hope. Not just any hope, but the greatest hope. God promised Eve, Eve who was tempted by the serpent, Eve who ate the fruit that that Adam and Eve were commanded not to eat. He promised her that from her would come an offspring who would crush the head of the serpent crush the head of the serpent. God promised that after Eve, one would come who would make all things right, that the works of Satan, the works of the serpent in the garden would be destroyed. And the rest of the Old Testament, we see promise after promise of this person to come. The lion of Judah, the greater prophet to come after Moses, the suffering servant, all of these, it's pointing to this one figure the Messiah. And so this is what we have to have in mind whenever we look at the gospel, is this great anticipation of the one who's going to come and make things right. And so now, what do we see in Jesus' ministry? What did the disciples miss? What have I so very often missed? Jesus is tempted in the wilderness after being baptized. Now, unlike Adam and Eve, who were tempted once by the serpent and fell into sin, Jesus is tempted three times, yet he does not sin. Then he leaves the wilderness and he calls his disciples, and the first miracle that Mark records after Jesus has left the wilderness, I should say, uh, well, you know, the first miracle that he records is casting an unclean spirit out of a man. Now, no doubt, this guy who had a demon cast out of him probably appreciated what Jesus was doing. But there's something deeper going on here. There's something greater that Mark, that that the other gospel writers, that Jesus is trying to show us when he does this. Yes, the demon is cast out of this man, and he's grateful. But this is showing us that the one who is promised in Genesis 3, the one who would come and crush the head of the serpent, is here and he is destroying the works of the devil. He is here, and he is crushing the head of the snake. He is here and destroying the kingdom of Satan and setting up his own heavenly kingdom. And so when you see, when you see Jesus casting out demons, remember that. This isn't just a random event. This is Jesus showing that he is destroying the works of Satan and setting up his own kingdom. What happens next? Jesus heals a man with leprosy. And remember, those who had leprosy were not allowed to worship God in the temple. They were untouchable. They were outcasts. Now, if you look at the Old Testament law, on one hand, there was very likely a good medical reason that this was the case. But it was pointing to some more true reality. Just as those who were unclean could not enter into the temple, We cannot come and truly worship God as we were made to do because we have sin. And so Jesus heals this man of his leprosy and allows him to be clean again. What does this show us? This shows us that Jesus, just as he took away this man's leprosy, just as he cleansed this man of his uncleanliness, he came to cleanse us of our sins and our iniquities so that we can come into God's presence and worship him as we were made to do. What does Jesus do next? Jesus heals a paralyzed man. This man is brought to Jesus for healing. Instead of healing him right away, Jesus says, Son, 
your sins are forgiven. Now this drives the Pharisees, the scribes crazy. They say he's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Jesus responds by asking them if it's easier to tell a paralyzed man to walk or is it easier to forgive his sins? Obviously, it's easier to forgive his sins. But to show that he can do both things, Jesus heals him and he gets up and he walks. And this passage here is showing us very, very clearly that, that Jesus who came to, to, to clean us, to make us right with God, has the power to forgive our sins. Oh, and this too, this is important. Jesus, having the power to forgive sins, is God. Jesus is God. Later on in Mark's gospel, Jesus heals uh, a man named Jairus. Uh, he, he heals his daughter. Jairus asks Jesus, he says, please come heal my daughter. Jesus starts going over, but by the time that Jesus gets there, his daughter is dead. Consequence of the fall of man. She, like all of us, will, has died. But yet Jesus says she's not dead, only sleeping. And he raises her from the dead. What does this show us? Yes, Jesus, Jesus resurrected people. People died and he, he raised them from the dead. But this is pointing us to something far greater. Jesus came to give us new life. Our biggest problem is not that we're all going to physically die someday. It's that we are walking around spiritually dead. And Jesus came to give us newness of life. Jesus came that we would not be dead in our sins, but have eternal life. We could go into so much more of what Jesus did, but we don't have time for that. So we're going to skip ahead to the feeding of the 5,000, because that's what Jesus specifically brings up in our passage this morning. What happens here? Well, let's take a look at a little bit of historical context. No, I keep doing that, but it's important. When Israel was being led out of Egypt, they were wandering through the wilderness. Now, I don't know if anybody's walked through the Saudi Arabian desert. There's not much food to eat there. And so Moses prays, and, and basically God from heaven gives them bread. Right? So that's the context in mind here. They're being led by the prophet Moses, and God gives them bread from heaven. But what happens now? Jesus who is God incarnate, right? We've seen that already. Jesus is God. <laughs> he comes down from heaven, takes on flesh. He's here on the earth and there's people, 5,000 men, which means there was probably well over 10,000 people total there. Jesus comes down from heaven and he gives bread to his people. This also shows us that Jesus is the true and better bread from heaven, but that's a topic for another message. What this is showing us here, well, we'll get into that in a second, actually. What happens right after this passage, right? The, he feeds the 5,000. And then what happens? Well, his disciples get out on a boat. They're going uh, across uh, the sea to, to uh, Bethsaida. And Jesus comes and he walks out on the water. And the disciples are being tormented by the wind. They're being tormented by the waters. And Jesus gets on the boat, and the waters immediately calm. Now, on one hand, this might just seem, okay, that's really cool miracle, right? It is. But this is pointing us back to something else from the Old Testament. You see, those Israelites who we looked at who are walking through the wilderness, as they were in the wilderness, after they had left Egypt, they were in danger. Pharaoh, who had enslaved them, wanted them back after setting them free. And so they were right on the edge of the Red Sea. They had mountains behind them, the Red Sea in front of them, and an army from one of the most powerful nations at the time about to pursue them. And God has Moses reach out his hand over the Red Sea. But what happens? It's not Moses who parts the Red Sea. If you look at the passage, it shows Moses is the one who raised out his hand, yes. But God himself comes and parts the Red Sea. And now Jesus, walking on water, gets in the boat, and the sea and the wind calms right away. Jesus is the one who calms the sea. Jesus is Lord over the sea. What is this showing us? As we've looked at, Jesus is God. 
God gave his disciples bread from heaven, and now Jesus, God in heaven, has come down to earth and given his people bread. But this shows us something else too. Moses did not give his people bread. Moses is not the one who did the work of parting the sea, but Jesus, Jesus gave the bread. Jesus himself calmed the sea. Jesus is one who is greater than Moses. Jesus is the promised Messiah, the promised greater prophet. Now, after all of this, you think the disciples would understand. They would get it. But when we look at the account of Jesus walking on the water, this is math, or sorry, Mark 6, verse 52, it says that the disciples were terrified. Why? For they did not understand about the loaves, but their hearts were hardened. They didn't get it. They didn't understand yet. After this, a lot of things happen. Good to look into. We don't have time for it. But let's just go to the feeding of the 4,000. Now, if you've ever looked at the feeding of the 4,000 and the feeding of the 5,000, it's a little interesting, and, and people have wondered about this for a while. Why are these so similar? Why is this miracle here, here twice? Um, modern secular scholars tend to look at this and go, aha, see, this proves that Mark's gospel isn't real. There's probably a copyist at some point who accidentally copied the same story and then modified it a little bit. But no, it's here for a reason. Mark had, uh, Mark recorded this miracle. Jesus did this miracle twice for a reason. They didn't get it last time, so he does it again. <laughs> He feeds his disciples. He feeds 4,000 people the same miracle twice. And now back in the boat, having experienced and participated, right? They handed the bread out to the people. They probably ate it. But having experienced this now twice, they still don't get it. They still don't get it. What's their problem? Let's think about their response. Jesus says, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of heaven. What's he getting at here? He's getting at a deeper spiritual truth. Beware of unbelief. Beware of the unbelief of the Pharisees. Beware of the unbelief of Herod, which comes and it consumes and it spreads. A spiritual truth that he's trying to teach them. And when they respond, it shows that they are focused on earthly things. And even in their earthly response, it shows a lack of unbelief on their part, right? They are worrying about their one loaf of bread that's not enough to feed them. But what just happened in the last few chapters? Jesus took bread and he multiplied it and he fed thousands of people. Surely he could do that again with their one loaf of bread. What's the problem with the disciples here? What do they not understand? Why does Jesus respond the way that he does? I think it's because they, like the Pharisees, have seen all of Jesus' miracles, they've heard his teaching, but they still have unbelief. Jesus is warning his disciples of unbelief because they are doing the exact same thing that the Pharisees were doing. Unbelief is dangerous. And this is why Jesus not only warns them, but strongly warns them, strongly responds to the Pharisees. A little leaven leavens the lump. A little unbelief can come in and wreak havoc. Unbelief is dangerous to God's people. I want to look at two examples here. Very different, but two examples of unbelief wreaking havoc on God's people. If you look at the Old Testament... What is the thing that the Israelites struggled more than any other thing with? Idolatry, right? And who do they pray to most often? Baal, the storm god. He brought the rain. And in that society, if you don't have rain, you don't have food. And if you don't have food, you die. And so most likely what this arose from because you see, at first at least, they're not rejecting God per se. They're just saying, let's have God, but let's, let's add in a little bit of, of Baal worship. Maybe this arose from, from the Israelites farming, saying, you know, there really wasn't a lot of rain this year. Uh, I, I don't know if God's going to provide for us. Unbelief. They doubt that God will do what he says he will do. 
and provide for his people. And so they say, let's, let's just worship Baal. Let's get a little bit more rain for our harvest. And it grew and it spread and it led to almost every problem we see in the Old Testament for Israel. Unbelief is dangerous. Little leaven leavens the lump. Another example, if we want to fast forward a couple thousand years, about a hundred years ago, in one of uh, the American mainline denominations, uh, there was a controversy. There were a few people started off small uh, in this denomination um, who began to have unbelief. It started small. They rejected the inerrancy of Scripture rejected the virgin birth, saying, you know, it's really not, it's impossible for a virgin to give birth. There's no way that the Bible is right about this. You'd say, well, Paul really couldn't have written this letter. I don't think the Bible is true. It started small. It started small. The denomination did not do anything to stop this, and they punished those who did. Their unbelief spread to seminaries, who then taught these destructive, unbelieving messages to young men in training. It grew, it took over the denomination, and it spread to every other mainline denomination. And what do we see nowadays in these churches? Universalism, tolerance, and even celebration of sin, rejection of the divinity of Christ, and even in some cases, outright atheism. A little leaven leavens the lump. Little unbelief has the potential to spread, and when it does, it wreaks havoc. And so when Jesus warns us of this, we should pay attention. So what I want to talk about now is how does unbelief impact us? How can we be impacted by unbelief? Where does the leaven come in? Two groups of people here. For unbelievers, Obviously, the big problem is unbelief. But think about this. There may be people here who come every week to church. They come, they hear the word preached, they hear the Bible, they sing the songs, they've been baptized, they take communion, they participate in fellowship. But this, this word of God, this Bible, it doesn't do anything. Jesus is not their Lord he has not changed their lives. It doesn't do anything. Like the Pharisees looking at all of these miracles and, and not changing as a result of them, not getting it, this can happen to us. It's terrifying. Unbelief. What about for us as believers? I think there are so many ways that unbelief can infiltrate, but I just want to tell you about some that I have struggled with and witnessed in my own life. How about prayer? There's been times where I've begun to have unbelief that God will answer my prayers. I pray, I pray, I pray, and it doesn't seem like they're being answered. And then it starts to spread, and I think, is God even hearing my prayers? I stop trusting God. I stop praying to God. Unbelief. What about witnessing? What about witnessing? Friends, family, coworkers who you know you've been praying over for, for weeks, for months, for years, for decades that God will save them and you don't see any fruit at all. Maybe begin to doubt that God will save them. So you stop praying for them. You stop witnessing to them, stop trying to lead them to Christ. And eventually, when there's no fruit, you resent God for not saving them. How about God's sovereignty? Something happens, something big happens, a trial comes, and instead of turning to God, we wrestle with unbelief. We say, well, how, could, how could God let this happen? We don't trust him, we don't pray to him, we don't go to his word, and so we begin to say, God must not be in control. God must not love me. What, what's going on here? And it spirals and it spirals and it spirals into despair. Last one, assurance of salvation. We begin to have unbelief and doubt that God loves us, that God's for us, that God works all things for our good and his glory. And this leads us to try and earn our salvation by working for it. And when that inevitably fails, because no one can measure up, we begin to despair and hate God 
when we can't. I know I said one more, but... I grew up in Colorado. This is not the state that I grew up in. The, the sin that's tolerated here, the, the, the wickedness, our, our government allowing abortion at any point in pregnancy, I begin to look at this and, and wrestle with unbelief. God, God, what are you doing here? Are you sovereign over our leaders who are voting for this? What, what am I going to do when my daughter grows up in this culture? What, what's going to happen? I begin to despair. What's happening here, God? Don't you see this? Unbelief. What's the solution to unbelief? When this comes in, when this starts to infiltrate or if you don't know Christ, what's the solution to unbelief? Let's keep reading. Remember, at this point, the disciples don't yet believe. Verse 22. And they came to Bethsaida, and some people brought to him a blind man and begged him to touch him. And he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the village. And when he had spit on his eyes and laid his hands on him, he asked, Do you see anything? And he looked up and said, I see people, but... They look like trees walking. Then Jesus laid his hands on his eyes again, and he opened his eyes, and his sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. This is a different miracle than usual, right? It's a two-step miracle. Usually Jesus just says something or, or puts his hands on the person, and they're healed right away. This isn't showing Jesus is running out of miracle power or something like that. Let's think about this here. He puts his hands on him and he sees, but it's, it's blurry. He sees people, but they look like trees walking around. And then he puts his hands on him and now he sees. What, what is this showing us? The disciples are starting to see. They're starting to understand. Maybe on the rest of this six hour boat ride after Jesus says, do you not yet understand? They've sat in silence and just thought, what has Jesus done? What does this show us? What happens after Jesus heals this blind man? This is one of the most significant passages in Mark's gospel. And Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? And they told him, John the Baptist, and others say Elijah, and others, one of the prophets. And he asked him, or asked them, but who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, you are the Christ. They got it. They understood Jesus is the Christ. These aren't just random miracles. These are showing that Jesus is God. Jesus is God. And so if you're here and you have unbelief and you don't know Christ, you don't know him, you sit here and God's word has never made an impact on your life or a change or anything like that. Look to Christ and see who he is. That he came, God came down, took on flesh, lived the perfect life. He came, he died to take away our sins, to cleanse us of our filth and our unrighteousness, that we can go and worship God. He died that we might not be dead, but have eternal life, live with him, reign with him forever. Jesus came that we would be saved. He died and he rose and he is willing and ready to save us, to adopt us as children. This is what solves our unbelief. If you don't know Christ, this is the key. Believe in Christ. Believe that he died for you. Believe that he is Lord, that he can save you from your sins. And for those of us who are believers, do the same thing. <laughs> Preach the gospel to yourself every day in every single one of these areas. Look to Christ, recognize who he is, and that what he said is true. When you struggle with prayer, look to Christ. Remember what he says about prayer. That he, who he is, the Son of God, mediates between God and man. We can be assured that when we pray, God not only hears our prayers, but surely will answer them because of Christ and because of who he is. Look to Christ when you doubt in your prayers. When you struggle with witnessing, look to Christ. I wrestle with this so much. 
but I have to remind myself, God saved me. He can save this person. God saved Paul, who killed the church. Can he not save these people? Can he not save this person? Keep praying, press on, look to Christ. When we struggle with God's sovereignty over every situation, remember the words of Scripture. Remember Christ. Look to Christ and who he is and what he has said, that he causes all things to work together for our good. In every trial and every tribulation, God is good, and we can rest in that and we can trust in that when we look to Christ and we understand who he is. In trials and tribulation, when we wrestle with God's sovereignty, look to Christ. And when we struggle with assurance of salvation, we look to Christ and we remember that he came to save us, not because of our works, not because of anything that we did, but because of his free grace, because he loved us. He who has begun a good work in us will surely bring it to creation. Remember this when we have unbelief. Look to Christ. If Christ saw every sin that you would ever commit and still died for you, still chose you, what can you do to separate yourself from him? Remember that. Look to Christ. When you look out at our people, at our state, at our country, you might be tempted to despair. You might be tempted to fall into unbelief. But remember that God is sovereign over our people. Jesus told his disciples, all authority on heaven and earth has been given to me. Jesus is Lord over our legislators. Jesus is Lord over our government. Jesus is Lord over our people. And so our state, our country might be going off the rails, but Jesus is right now taking a people for himself from every tribe, tongue, and nation. He will surely redeem a people for himself from our generation, from my daughter's generation, and he will revive us once again, I am sure, because of who he is. Look to Christ. We will wrestle with unbelief, we will wrestle with doubt. But when we do, when it comes in every single thing, remember who Christ is. Look at the word, look at the things that he did. See what it represents. Rest in this, meditate on this, share this with every other person you know. Look to Christ, rest in Christ, believe in Christ. Let's pray. Oh Lord, we believe, help our unbelief. We need you, dear Lord God. We need you very much. Without the power of your spirit, without your love and mercy and blessing, our unbelief will consume us. But Lord God, we ask that you would help us, that you, as you did with the blind man, would open our eyes, that we would see you, that we would understand who you are and why you came, and that we would confess alongside Peter and the disciples that you are the Christ. I pray, Father, that we would be a people who believe, that we would be a people who know you and love you and understand. Oh, Lord God, please help us. Please help us to believe. Please help us to know you and rest in you in everything. Oh Lord God, would you keep us from sin? Would you keep us from stumbling? Would you keep us from unbelief? Cause us to see you as you are and make us more like Christ in everything. In Jesus' name, amen.